How many touch points do you think it takes for someone to remember a brand? A lot. Like several million, easily. <laughs> What's Can't your wait. flavor of choice in Laffy Taffy? I had a business that was doing $45,000 a month in sales. I frankly believe that remote work is easier and better once you know the team dynamic. But Performance Max is an incredible retargeting tool okay. um, in Google. Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Brennan. Brennan's been the CEO of Propelic, which is a digital marketing agency for roughly 10 years, I would say. 10 years is correct. Yes. Um, but welcome to the show. Thank you. Shortest intro I've ever had. Um, <laughs> There's not much to say anyway. So. Uh, but since we know that YouTube retention falls after five minutes, what do you want to plug? I don't, Where should people reach out? Oh, the, the visitor attention falls after five minutes. I mean, on long form videos, LinkedIn, it's like seven minutes. LinkedIn, Brennan Bliss, B-R-E-N-N-E-N. Bliss. Okay, and we'll link everything, but yeah. I've started plugging everyone in the beginning, and then we'll plug again at the end. Okay, so. wonderful. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Um, I bet I can achieve a two-minute attention fall-off, whereas other people retain people for five. I bet I can get them to leave in two. Okay. <laughs> um, but one thing I like asking everyone is, where do you think your entrepreneurial journey started? My entrepreneurial journey started as a very virtuous product of me not having any friends growing up. Okay. <laughs> um, and what did that uh, become into? Like, did you start a business? Did that you became me finding ways to build something. I was four, 13. I was in middle school when I built my first website. It was for my mom. Um, she's a speech pathology clinic. Um, took me the entire summer. I think it was, it was either seven or $1,300. I can't remember what she paid me for it. It was one of those two numbers. It was certainly well below the child labor standards and minimum federal U S wage. So in both cases, no, I'm kidding. Well, I'm not kidding. That was, that was all very true, but I, I, um, didn't have many people to like, I just, I was, I was frankly bullied growing up never only physically once, but, um, the rest of it was, um, I, I was, uh, I changed schools twice because I didn't fit in. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it was like a product of ADHD, of dyslexia, of me just being different and weird. It wasn't because I was, it has nothing to do with like being gay or anything. I wasn't out at that point in my life. Um, I guess I, maybe people knew before I did. <laughs> um, but I just filled the time with building things. Hobbies, and, projects. Yeah. What would I do other than try to make some money? I mean, I wanted to buy like as many nerds ropes as I possibly could and nice. Laffy Taffy's as I possibly could. That's what you do when you're 14. What's your right? flavor of choice in Laffy Taffy? Oh, um, green apple. And what's the pink one? Pink lemonade? No, I don't no, I think it's like strawberry okay. or something. I'm a grape and then green apple person. Oh, I do like the grape ones. You know what I don't like is the banana ones. I hate those. Those are nasty. I hate those. Whoever created those needs to find a new job. Yeah. But I'm a nerd person. I don't like nerds rope. I'm a okay. like hardcore, like pink and purple box nerd. So okay. All the, the fancy stuff is okay. But the original I'm, nerds. I'd like the little, they have the little. Yeah. The little packets. Like dots now. That are, I, I don't have, I don't know the dots. They're the same thing as the ropes, but it's just. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I'll have to try that out. Well, that's cool. And so you build that website, you got paid for it. And then what did that spark? Yeah. I went to the same school as a bunch of other people whose parents happened to run businesses, small businesses. Nice. And I just started soliciting. Them. Nice. <laughs> for websites. Yeah. Nice. Um, I was my first website that I got paid for from a third party was I don't it wasn't my first I did one for my then brother's girlfriend but now sister-in-law my sister-in-law um, and then I did a couple of websites for other small things and then like the, one website in my junior or senior I think it started in my junior year of high school it was yeah started in my junior year of high school I sold it for like ten thousand dollars um, and it was a retreat center listing website, nice. like a marketplace site. Nice. And that was really cool. Um, I, at that point, learned that when you sell something for $10,000, there's not going to be $10,000 left after you finish it. So I dug myself a bit of a hole. And, and we can talk about that whole, like, my yeah. experience with, like, money and my weird, not, just, like, my 
what I, all the things that I've learned in terms of like borrowing, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and not rather <laughs> borrowing. Um, but that was how it started. And then I just kept selling websites and then I realized websites you have to do once and then they don't keep paying you. Whereas marketing services, which I taught myself SEO to get more web design clients. Like I taught myself SEO and the college football playoffs foundation hired me at the age of what, eight, 17 to build their website, 16 or 17 to build their website. Um, because I got ranked position one for best Dallas web design agency. Okay. Nice. And then I started doing that and then we added, we went to do everything and said we could do everything. Cause I was trying to like build an agency. Then I realized we did everything horribly. And then we narrowed it back into just SEO. Okay. And then uh, grew that and then pivoted to just SEO for travel, for the travel industry, which nice. has been a nice pivot. So that first sale that you did, the 10 grand, um, how long did that take? That what was that process? In excess of a year. Okay. The delivery of that project. Okay. And it was the most painful year. <laughs> it was. And why did you say, um, why were you in the hole after the sale? Oh, because I was like so happy. I bought like a $600 okay. jacket. Got it, I, got it. I, this is, this is, I, I went through the process of for, for the first time having money yeah. and it being in a business uh, at the age of like 16. So yeah. incredibly irresponsible. I'm only slightly more responsible now, but at that point I was really bad. Um, and I, like the moment I turned 18, but by the time I was 19, I was in $200,000 worth of consumer debt. Okay. Nothing for it was school. I was spending money on things I didn't need to prove I was someone I wasn't and people I didn't need to know, need to impress or need to like people that certainly didn't care about me. Um, and you know, I spent the better half of two or no, not the better half of no, I spent two or three years paying that off and kind of learned my lesson with finances and I can talk about that again for yeah. and I think it's also like culturally I've noticed so being from India saving is just second nature like there's no like taking debt is unless it's for a house you don't really take that mm -hmm. like it's really not a thing you do and have everyone you know is always like save 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 mm -hmm. so when I came here and I saw like a credit card mm -hmm. I didn't have a credit card for the first couple of years of me starting the work in the US because in my mind, I'm like, I don't want to take credit. I don't need to take credit. Why should I take credit for anything? Because I'm spending money I don't have, mm -hmm. theoretically. But then you do the whole credit card points and stuff, so it's different. But um, I'm never take using credit cards and spending money I don't have to pay off. Mm -hmm. And it's just a mindset difference. Versus I had friends who did cards. Like, yeah, I have like 10, 20K in credit card. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I could never even relate to how that was a possibility. No. It was just such a cultural shift yeah. difference. No, the U.S. is um, it, such a consumer economy. Yeah. Um, it's like a rapid consumer economy such that people are too... I mean, it's keep it's a keeping up with the Joneses economy. Yeah, um, and um, I have an uncle who came here, has a successful business, makes a couple million a year in India. He went to open a credit card. He got a five hundred dollar limit. Yeah, that's what happens. But kid out of college gets a five ten thousand dollar limit, mm -hmm. and it just didn't make. And now I've understood sort of how the system works. But at that point, I was like, this doesn't make any sense to me. Well, I ended up in a bunch of like shark loans okay. like um like weekly pay like paypal credit like this is me trying to build something i i am I, I don't know if i've like talked about this in a recorded fashion ever um but my god the amount like so i was in college i was in my freshman year of college at about half a million in revenue in my business and i was only there for seven months i dropped out after seven months when they tried to get me to write a resume I said sorry <laughs> no i'm done <laughs> not for me um but during that seven months i um worked so hard to like try to prove i was better than everybody else which is just in retrospect such a I'm, i've learned a lot since then and i've changed significantly since then but i was like going on fancy vacations and i bought a bought a sixty thousand dollar car what what college student needs a sixty thousand yeah. dollar car yeah um and it was really, I mean, I ended up in, I, I said 200,000, but it was like, it was the scary stuff with like 30% interest. Yeah. Um, and I'm like my life right now I have a mortgage and that's it. And life is easy. So that's cool. And what, what was the turning point where you went from, Hey, I'm doing half a million revenue, but I have this debt I'm spending. What was the turning point where you're like, I got to fix this. Like, this is not 
Um, I read a book called Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. Yeah. Um, and Mike, I've actually since had the opportunity to speak with. I was introduced through a fellow member of the Entrepreneurs Organization, nice. um, J.B. Blanchard, who's an incredible person. Um, but the book gave me ho- so actually honestly this may be controversial but dave ramsey okay dave like hardcore dave ramsey like uh, yes i know i'm a gay jew but the financial like the like the the fire that it lit under my butt to go and understand and pay crap off and like live on less than i make um just listening to three hours of that podcast again like different political leanings than me different yeah. religious leanings than me but i can still listen and yeah, digest it and it, it's like the core like yeah. information is still the, irrespective of yeah. That, yeah save a little bit of money pay off everything live on beans and rice don't spend a single cent extra it's really like like salt of the earth like grit stuff yeah. and um it took me again two years i got a thirty thousand dollar tax refund in um in 2021 and my husband i was like oh let's go on vacation in, in my at the time boyfriend husband now um said pay off your debt like pay it off and I never looked back nice. after that last payment. So I don't know who I was listening to a podcast. They're talking about how Dave Ramsey's empire is like a eight nine hundred million dollar yeah easily like yeah operation. I was like oh, I didn't I mean, know I, it was that big. The business is a three hundred million dollar top line business. I think the real estate that the business sits in is a couple hundred million dollars. He owns about three or four hundred homes, um, and not need, not to mention like stock market and performance. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. It's pretty incredible. Again, like I, irrespective of any of the social concerns um, or disagreements or or misaligned or Ill, not aligned beliefs that we may have, I think the financial council is is exceptional. And it's not mathematically exceptional. It's not like it doesn't make sense on paper, but the fire that it lights up yeah. under you to like pay out the smallest debt first and get the get the courage like to see like, Oh, I don't have a payment to chase anymore. It was only $80 a month. It was an $800 jet, but that snowball effect is pretty incredible. And it adds up. And then you don't think about it in small increments, but like 10 bucks at a time Mm -hmm. very quickly becomes a couple hundred thousand. That's what we're doing on our house. It's amazing. Like the amortization chart on a house is outstanding. It's like, um, you look at, changing adding an extra thousand dollars a month or whatever you add and yeah. you cut 15 years off a 30-year loan it's pretty yeah. incredible yeah. um what what interest rate did you get your house <laughs> to 7.125 oh you bought recently or? i bought it recently oh okay okay just waiting for that to go down yeah I, allegedly there's supposed to be a rate cut in like september, september. October, that's what so i heard we'll yeah. see um but yeah i feel like um like in India, buying a house is not a financial decision. It's an emotional decision. Because mm-hmm. like for Indians, buying a house is like, a, oh, this is my house. I'm going to make it my space. It has mm-hmm. to have the right um, energy and all that stuff, right? And I was listening to another podcast for an Indian investor, and she's like, buying a house in India never makes financial sense. Mm-hmm. It's not about the this is the right money move. Mm-hmm. It's the everything else that attached to buying a house, setting it up, having your family over, having your friends over, like the amount of joy that brings someone Mm -hmm. outweighs the one or 2% you're probably losing on a house. Yeah. I mean, like, let's look at the financials, even in the U S on a house, you pay for the house, right? You pay, let's, I'm going to use a flat number. This is not my house. I'm just using a million dollars as a flat house, a flat number. Okay. Um, you pay that and then you have a 7.125% interest rate. That is a lot of money every month. That's what, $70,000 $70,000 a year yeah. in interest. Roughly. So you get a write off on that, but you're still paying the bank to, yeah. not, to not pay less taxes. So you get, what, 35% if you're in that bracket, a uh, reduction on that spend. So you're saving maybe twenty thirty five thousand dollars $35,000. In tax. There's 35, yeah. So there's that. You're paying 70 to save 30. Um, so there's a loss there, a $40,000 loss in that first year on your mortgage. And then all of the investment that goes into maintaining it and upkeeping it all for like a 6% return. Eh, not really worth it. it. (laughs) I mean, depending on the market. your house, like you know what the fuck you want to do in your house. Yeah, exactly. I don't You do it because of that. Now, one of the things that happens in a house that didn't happen in an apartment or a rental was like my grass gets taken over by some sort of beetle. I'm on vacation in Iceland and my neighbor's like calling me saying, hey, can we fix this for you? And I'm like, oh God, unbelievable amounts of guilt. Just let it die. (laughs) Just let it die. Yeah, yeah. But no, that's nice. Um, and so, 
you make the shift, you change the way you're operating. What's your key takeaway from Profit First? What's your like aha uh-huh moment? Aha uh-huh yeah. moment. Buckets moving into buckets, so it's it's harder to play with. Like we've limited the like I have gotten to the point where we can't. It's harder to run Profit First the larger the business gets. Um, so basically, what I found is that if I take in a thousand dollars and put ten dollars in my owner's compensation account, ten dollars in tax savings. Five dollars in a profit account, and the rest I'm not going to seventy-five. Yeah, in operating, I don't move it, and then if I put it on operating account, I would spend it all. So it's it's like it's like a gas. Like yeah. you fill yeah. the space that you're in, right? So if you have less money to work with because you're paying yourself first, the you have the opportunity to better. Um, capital better, efficient. Capital yeah, be efficient, more efficient. It's yeah. funny. I was watching The Office, and like Phyllis says pay yourself first in the office. And I'm like, yeah, it's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> pay yourself first. Yeah. And I think a lot of people starting out get that wrong, right? Like even if it's pay yourself 500 bucks, whatever the amount is, whatever you think is sustainable, depending on your cash flow and situation, you should always try to pay yourself something. Yeah. Because your time is worth whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. And garnered, you have equity, blah, blah, blah. But over time, if you don't pay yourself anything, it's going to be a lot harder to justify a bigger pay and you start small and you, as you get better and bigger. You and, and, you know, I look at my company's budget now and my seller doesn't really make, make up a meaningful piece of it anymore. And then the fact of the matter is if I cut my salary, it doesn't really change anything if we're in a bad situation. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I would rather, I would first cut like our annual retreat because if I'm not able to eat, <laughs> how am I supposed to provide for my team? Right. Yeah, so makes sense. Um, that's how I, how I look at my compensation um, now, admittedly, like I've, I would pull it back if I needed to. Yeah. You know, I like the automated, like 20% into saving. Like I deposit a certain amount every month, it's the same amount every month, and then it gets auto transferred into all the personal, nice. like savings accounts and mortgage payoff. What, what bank or what platform do you use to do that? Oh, God. I've tried to change, I've changed like so many times. Um, right now it's just a local bank with ACH transfers on okay. a bi- bi-monthly schedule, but there's like all these cool routing tools that I've seen and I really want to start using, but like why pay $9 a month for something that is free. <laughs> it's free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Convenience out yeah. of anything else. Now, one of the other problems I learned with profit first was that you had to be careful about the overdraft rules in your bank account. Cause you may have $400,000 sitting in an account, but if you use a separate payroll account to pay payroll and you forget to transfer it, you're going to bounce that, hit, get an $35 overdraft fee and a $50 fee from your payroll service. Yeah. I, the number of times I've overdrafted accounts while I still have a, bu- I've overdrafted accounts while I had no money and I've overdrafted accounts while I have a lot of money and neither is good. <laughs> yeah. hundred um, percent. I think it's just basic fundamentals, right? It comes down to what you're talking about of like just knowing where you're at, knowing basic cash flow input output. Like I think a lot of people just overlook, well, like, I, even if you do the five buckets, but even before that, just basic inflow outflow. So I think I like, here's one thing. So I coach a group. I'm in a group called the entrepreneurs organization. And there's something that we have um, in most, most cities it's called EO Accelerator in Austin it's called EO Ignite and I was coaching I I was sitting with my group of five last week last Wednesday and like I was starting to talk we were talking about their the way that money moves in their business and I'll be like one of my one of my accelerators had a 1.2 million dollar business and we were talking about the way that cash moves within that business and she didn't know what a P&L was um, so I changed the entire talk track of Amer- <laughs> like, like I, I did basics in how the three state, how the three, um, cash flow documents work, a statement of cash flows, balance sheet and profit and loss statement. And then, um, the other thing we was, the, she was dealing with is like, how do you recognize a, um, like, or how do you, like, if someone pays me $50,000 in November and then I don't do the work until finish the work until February how do you not pay taxes? And I was like, okay, we're going to do basic accrual accounting as well. (laughs) Nice. And how did you end up learning all these things? Was it by trial and error or were you always in these situations where like, well, this is probably not right. I got to go figure it out. It's all self-taught through books and my community. It's not, when I say self-taught, it wasn't a formal training. So actually, one of our directors, our senior director of growth marketing, um, when he 
started working at Propelic, one of his goals was like to get an MBA. And it's amazing because there's so much you can learn if you just expose yourself to the problems 100%. and start solving the problems. And he hasn't done that yet. And I think that could have a play that could nice. be part of the reason. We'll try to send him this clip of the video. Paul is exceptional. <laughs> and Paul, if you're listening to this, thank you for making my life easier. <laughs> um, but going back to your journey. So at what point, so you went from web design to everything to just SEO. Yes. And along this journey, how long was it just you? And at what point did you start hiring people? Well, the funny thing is it's not just SEO now. It's SEO and paid media. Okay. And then we're, I, I have a new a director of client success whose primary focus is going to be developing new services that started okay. today. Um, so that'll change. It's funny. It's like an yeah, expand, yeah, contract, yeah. expand thing. Um, when did it become someone in addition to me in my senior year of high school? I okay. was 18 and hired someone full time to run ads. It was a hilarious decision. I cannot believe the things that I've done. I was getting paid $2,000 a month by someone to manage their $10,000 Google ads budget. And I hired someone for $60,000 a year to do that for me okay. full time. So you were losing. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. And that was not a strategic decision. Like this was a silly, like I was not thinking, but she stayed for about two years, three years. And then I hired someone named Emily on our team. And so we, we went through three people and then Emily joined Emily is exceptional. She's been with us for five years now. Um, this was in 2019 that Emily started. And Emily was the first like core hire that's still been there. I was in my freshman year of college and then added on a number of other people um, over that initial year before the pandemic. So we were at four people total, including not a number of people. We were at four people total. And then pandemic we repositioned into travel only and now we're i think at like 20 20 something i think it's close to 25 nice. including some of our part-time but i think full-time u.s team is about 20 people okay that's cool yeah and so what are your thoughts on team building and you mentioned an annual retreat uh, why do you do that why do you spend on that uh, and what is team building for you what does that mean for you well i just like going on cruises and that's what we do once a year <laughs> um so Team building, honestly, I wish we were in an office. Okay. It's so hard. It is so hard. I had an employee that we hired. Like, let me just talk about that first, and then we'll yeah, come to the yeah. team building. I hired someone three months ago to come and be our full-time recruiter, and found out she was working two full-time jobs at the same time. For employed. For a different employer, yeah. I mean, like... So things like that don't happen when you're in an office very easily. Yeah. And that's one of the things it's like, I have a, a high degree of trust for the good people. Um, but when it's a new hire, you don't know. And I'm, I'm an e like, I'm not a, I'm not as high a pressure a leader as I'd like to be. I would like to be able to put the gas on harder and like drive like just drive further. But I'm really, I'm not a micromanager. Yeah. So being out of the office is hard. I would love to be able to just like be able trust, but verify. Um, but there's like people on my team, Emily, like people on my team. I'm not going to list names because if they listen to this and don't hear the name, it's going to be like, yeah, but yeah. there's people on my team that are, I know, like, I know that there's no way Paul, who we just talked about is going to do anything but work 12 hours a day. Not because I asked him to, but because that's what he thinks it takes to get the job done. Well. Yeah. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, in terms of team building, you would do the annual retreat. Um, we have a meeting rhythm that comes out of a book called um, Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. Okay. And the meeting rhythm is basically a uh, daily huddle. It starts at 10.07 a.m. And the reason we do that is because we want people to show up. When it starts on the hour, we notice people don't show up on time. Uh, if you don't show up, you get shamed publicly. <laughs> um, and that's what are, your, what are you doing today? What are your top priorities? And where are you stuck? And what are you grateful for? Nice. It takes 10 minutes to get through 20 people. Um, and then we have a weekly team meeting for the SEO and paid media teams. And then we have a monthly all hands. And then we have biweekly one-on-ones with every manager and direct report. Okay. So there's a meeting rhythm and touch point rhythm. Um, come to think of it, we were going to be doing team building exercises, but the person that was going to be doing that no longer has a job at Propelic because they're working two full-time jobs yeah. when they were directly asked about it and said they weren't. Um, yeah, I've never felt more taken advantage of than yeah. I did in that situation. Um, but I, you know, I think getting everybody in a room once a year is incredibly important. Yeah. I frankly believe that remote work 
is easier and better once you know the team dynamic. Mm -hmm. Once you know how to work with each other. Once you know, is this person a Slack person? Are they a message person? Are they a schedule something on my calendar to talk to me person? Mm -hmm. And like you understand how they work. So we once use, you understand that, being remote becomes a lot easier. I 100% agree. And we use predictive index and culture index to make that happen. Um, it's a, a like basically a four point assessment of someone's workplace traits, not a personality test. Like this is statistically significant and can be legally used in all states as a job interview process step. Um, and we look at their autonomy. So how much they want to be the leader versus help lead, help help it serve an outcome. Uh, we look at social ability, how much they like want a meeting agenda versus <laughs> wanting to, uh, to just go and talk and think yeah. out loud. Like me, we look at urgency and we look at attention to detail. And when someone's high on that social ability level, like put a meeting on the calendar, right? Whereas someone that's low, you get to send them an agenda, make them think about it. Yeah. For... Makes sense. Yeah. And no, I think a lot of people underestimate, oh yeah, new hire onboard remote. And I'm like, that's good. But if you want to really tap someone's full potential and really hone them for what you're, what you've hired them for, understanding exactly what you just said, their work style, their habits, like how do they perform in different situations yeah. can make miles of difference. You know what I want to do is I want to be in the same room as, and this is my argument to go to Hawaii to see our new director of sales is that I want to be in the same room as my director of sales to train them. Um, I feel like that's a little bit of a stretch though. <laughs> Why don't you fly them out to Austin? No, I would like to go to Hawaii. <laughs> okay. um, are you a beach person or? No, but I like Hawaii. <laughs> nice. And so going back to your journey, you start hiring, you do team building once a year. How do you think about growing the team, scaling, and pulling yourself out of the business. So I'm no longer even remotely involved on delivery okay. um, of our services. So that happened about two years ago. Nice. Um, sales I'm doing right now, I'm getting myself out of. Um, we'll do probably about $4 million in sales this year, and nice. I'd like to do that, double that next year, and either be involved at the same level as this year or less involved. Um, that's the last piece. And then I can be mostly strategic and just okay. work with my direct reports. Um, I could not scale the business until I got out of delivery. If you're in an agency, this is advice. I don't do advice giving very often, but this is advice. You need to get out of delivery if you 100%. want to scale. If you don't want to scale, if you want to be a fractional CMO model or you see CFO or whatever your model is, do that. But if you want to scale your firm, you, ha you can't spend all the time scaling your clients. You have to build processes that scale your clients and then have a great team that scales your clients. 100%. How many hires do you think you've gone through? So like, <laughs> let's say you're at 25 people now. How many people did it take to go through to get to the 25 you're at right now? Um, well, we are like the people who are on our team are the right people okay. right now. Um, and they know that because the ones that we hired that were a mistake are gone. Um, I have, as my friend Deb Gabor says, I encourage them to pursue excellence elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and I do that very, very quickly when they're not the right fit, as in like it's an everyday conversation with the director. If this person's not working out, when can we replace them? When can we send them on their way? Uh, the reason being is, um, I, think, I think this one comes from Dave Ramsey. It's sanctioned incompetence. Um, sh sanctioned incompetence is basically a sign that like, okay, I'm allowing one person to underperform, so everybody thinks they can underperform, and we can't have that. So we push people out pretty quickly. Uh, I would say... Uh, first off, our hiring process, we go through 400 people for everyone that we hire. Okay. Um, at least 400 applicants because um, it's so damn easy to apply on LinkedIn right now. Um, and then I in have terms my thoughts on job boards. but I want to hear those, actually. I'm going to tell you this, and then we should talk yeah, about that because yeah. I'm very curious. Um, I would say we have a 50% hiring success rate, which is just being honest, um, which I have a lot of, like, mental trash about it because I feel bad if someone leaves a company to come work for us and then, you know, it didn't work out, didn't work out, but I've had to get over that. Um, now I know people that like dismiss, like the way we do it is very generous. Like I had someone, even the person that, that was, um, only here for three months and then had a separate job. Uh, I still gave her a two, two week severance. Cause I was like, I know this is catching you off guard. She had, was going through some financial stuff. Um, but, we 50% hiring success. So if you're talking 25, there's probably 50 that or 25 that we've, we've let go. Okay. In that. Um, I would say that's still pretty good. The reason I said I have comments on job board, I worked at indeed for five, six years. Oh. And so I have, I like, I've seen the other side of like what it takes, right. Mm -hmm. To jobs applies. And 
my take is that I feel like HR tech companies are incentivizing the wrong actions because money comes from employers for mm -hmm. sponsoring jobs. And you sponsor a job when you get more applicants. Mm -hmm. So how do you get more applicants? You make that process really easy. Mm -hmm. Whether you hire or not depends on the company, but the top of the funnel, the job boards, the uh, ATSs that get you applicants are not incentivized to help you get hires. Mm -hmm. They're just incentivized to top of funnel, right? Mm -hmm. They don't care yeah. if you hire one or not from yeah. this. And I think the industry is just fundamentally built a different way because of the way <laughs> these models work. And everyone incentivizes the one click apply. No, I mean, this is why you use recruiters, right? Um, but I mean, uh, recruiters are incredibly expensive yeah. for what they do. Yeah. Like I'm paying $20,000 to hire a $100,000 employee. And that's if they work out within the... And they, six, I negotiate six months yeah, of yeah. guarantee, but... Um, and this just goes higher when you hire executives. Oh, if yeah. If you're hiring like VPs and plus, the fees are at least 50% of the salary. No way. Um, yeah, depending on the kind of executive recruiter. That's outrageous. Because executive recruiters are then, they they put themselves in a different class. Of, mm -hmm. um, like like normally, I think it's one or two months of salary is what you would pay. Yeah, for, two. Yeah. So, or 20%. But um, executives are just higher. That's um, pretty easy. Yeah. Um, I I don't know who, I, was, I met someone in SF and they hired a CPO paid them like 300k mm -hmm. but the recruiter commission was 140 god um and they ended up firing the person after six months for whatever like board issues and so they couldn't even like use the recruiter to find a new one because Jeez. they had technically gone over the time so it's oh, contact god. um but yeah so i i think the reason i ask is team hiring team building is very important especially when you're running and calling the shots because if you can't rely on someone, if you don't like the way they work, the way they deliver, if you have to like second guess yourself and you're like, oh, show me all these emails before you send them, mm -hmm. I think it just makes life more stressful. That's funny. This, this director of sales I heard, um, I asked him to write an email and, and I don't know if I explicitly asked him to send it to me to approve. And this was his first day. And I'll be like, this guy's a hundred thousand dollar base salary. So I'm like, I'm paying for, for good people. experience. Yeah. Um, it's like a 200 K on target earnings. So, um, or 175 or something like that. And he didn't send the email to me because I don't know if I explicitly asked him. I think I implied it. Yeah. And he sent it to the client. And I was like, that's better than what I would have written. Yeah. <laughs> and so it just, I think it makes you feel good about a good hire, right? Yeah. Is that things went well. I think I've added two people like that to the team in the past two weeks and I'm feeling really good about it. Nice. Uh, we've just got more experienced people coming in, which is really, it's about time. So you mentioned you have a couple of new directors and senior directors mm -hmm. in place. What was the point at which you were like, okay, now I need like a dedicated senior. It executive. was July 5th of last year. Okay. I hired Paul, um, oversee the delivery department. Cause I had someone else that was causing a lot of problems. Um, you know what I learned in Washington, if you fire someone, they can sue you for no reason at all. And they always come out on top as the employee simply because the laws, the laws. <laughs> You just end up settling. Um, so we don't hire in Washington okay. anymore <laughs> unless there's someone really compelling. Um, but then you make the move. <laughs> then we make the move. Yeah. Again, like there's states are not protected classes. Yeah. Like, if you, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I, uh, so I had to hire someone to take that person's role and that turned into a disaster very quickly. Yeah. Um, that person was not happy. Um, but I, was paying Paul more than I was paying myself. It was the scariest hire I'd ever made. At the time it was like, well, it was like 12 grand a month, 13 grand a month. It's gone up significantly <laughs> since then. But I mean, that was more than, that was way more than I was taking home for myself. I think I was taking home like 8,000 for myself a month at that point. Um, we've gone through a significant period of growth of the last year. We've quadrupled in size. Nice. So we went from a million to 4 million over the past year. And it's nice. been, it's been, it's been a test of my, patience <laughs> I, I think that's a good segue into you you've mentioned on some calls we've been on before where you niche down to ah. the travel right yeah and so was that the the catalyst to the growth or yes hands down first of all why did you decide to pick a niche was there a signal did, did someone tell you niche down or did you look at the data and you're like we got a niche down or w what pushed you towards at a mentor down? and I had a coach I had a business that was doing 
$45,000 a month in sales and one of our clients made up half of that. And this was in the pandemic. Yeah. And I was scared and I was paying too much to one of the coaches to not listen to them. And they were both saying position, position, position. And they okay. both had highly positioned firms that had scaled quickly. Nice. And similar space like SEO, paid media. Um, one was, yes. The other was software engineering. Okay. So um, it's called Praxent. It's a firm for, um, they do, um, s what is it? They do FinTech um, okay. software engineering and they're like 150 employees. Nice. Um, they're based here in Austin. The owner is Tim Hamilton. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my entire life ever. Like no stop. Like he's a brill He's a genius. He's a freaky genius. Okay. Um, and also an incredible coach and friend. Um, but I would say, uh, niching down was the most impactful decision we've made. And it was travel because we had one really successful case study, a U.S. search word in travel. And I love the travel industry. And we had one client in the travel industry when we did that repositioning. And now we have 40. Nice. And it's been two and a half, three years. Nice. And when you niche down... What changes? Did you like switch up your flows and processes or are you doing anything different for this industry? Or are you just like, hey, SEO for travel so and we'll, paid media for travel? Yeah, we'll talk about, let's talk about the marketing side and then we'll talk about the service side. Yeah. So on the marketing side, and remind me if I forget to do, to do the question directly. Um, on the marketing side, um, so David C. Baker is a guy that writes about agencies, writes how to build an agency. He wrote a book called The Business of Expertise, and he talks about how important pattern recognition is and how if you can recognize the same patterns that results in expertise, you can charge more for your services. All of these things have been incredibly accurate. Um, now, one thing to note of um, being a generalist is it's very hard to choose where to show up. Like, what conferences do you sponsor? What email newsletters do you sponsor? But now it's like, oh, these are the things that our customers read. These are the conferences our customers attend. If we just show up there, we can speak just to our customers, and it's like fishing in a barrel. Although you typically eat the fish with our customers. We hope for a long and prosperous relationship. <laughs> yeah. So our marketing has changed entirely. Got it. Um, on the service side, a hundred percent. So we developed a framework and philosophy called performance bookings. It's got five key pillars that help kind of like everything from channel dependence to setting North stars correctly and understanding the traveler research journey and leveraging data between channels. Um, so there's, there's a lot of travel specific findings like seasonality that we put into that, that result in a much more, um, tailored marketing approach for the market nice. that we're working with. And this then drives, <coughs> both your paid media as well as your SEO strategy for that particular company. And new service development, and yes, 100%. Nice. With travel companies, is there a particular insight you have about travel companies that's just lesser known? Hmm, like, could dig for, so here's the thing. Um, travel research is incredibly predictable in a lot of cases, at least in the bell curve, in the center of the bell curve. Um, Expedia did a research study called this, it was the path to purchase in 2023 and how travelers search, plan, and book their trips. And there's these four distinct stages that they map out. We say there's a fifth, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But it's inspire, um, it's inspiration, research, planning, and booking. No, inspiration, planning, booking, experiencing, I believe is what the four stages are. And we just add the captivate stage after the booking is made before the trip has gone on because you can upsell and sell yeah. ancillaries. Um, but you, you need to build audiences at the top of the funnel because people look at 25 pages on the day that they're going to make the purchase. And that's 30 to 60 days after they started their research. Yeah. So if you have one of those touch points, if you have a piece of content that gets a touch point at the beginning of research, there's absolutely no way they're going to remember your brand when they get to the purchase stage. So what we say is build audiences for your content that should be early in the research process and then retarget those audiences 30 days after, 60 days after. See what performs better than run with that audience. So it's really bringing the traveler down the purchase journey. Nice. Is th that's an example of a travel-specific finding that we have. Another one would be travel is an incredibly visual purchase journey. Yeah. Um, in every single industry, a faster moving page that's lighter, fewer kilobytes, fewer megabytes, you should measure yeah, in kilobytes, yeah. is typically gonna, gonna perform better from an SEO standpoint. We run statistical analysis and have found consistently that heavier pages work better in travel, typically just because images are very heavy. Makes sense. It's not like add a two yeah. megabyte picture to your page yeah. for no reason, but. Makes sense. Um, and no, I think that's <laughs> a interesting insight. So when you talk about retargeting, what tools are you using to 
retarget someone on this journey across platforms. So at a very like high level, yeah, it's just meta okay. properties um, and Google properties and uh, also some some um, programmatic in there. Um, if you want to get really sophisticated, like connected television, um, you can use email retargeting. There's all different ways as long as you have first party customer data for the emails. Um, but Performance Max is an incredible retargeting tool okay. um, in Google, and uh, so it's just standard display. Now you you want twenty to thirty percent of your spend at the most going into display and travel is what we've found. Um, but definitely pulling people down the funnel, like increasing your bid for people who have already been to your website that have that brand recognition on just search ads. So many different ways to do it. How many touch points do you think it takes for someone to remember a brand? So there's like all these words of like seven to 17. I have no idea. Okay. Um, all I know is that six months after their purchase and after their trip, about four to five percent of travelers remember where they booked it. So brand recognition is very hard in travel because it's a okay. very commoditized space. They're all selling the same thing. Okay. And then that just probably makes paid media a lot harder and mm. more expensive. Yeah. What's you? You said you want to double revenue next year. Sort of. Do you have a long term goal? Do you think three, five years ahead or are you more? No, I'm thinking three to five years ahead. Um, I don't know whether SEO, whether paid media, whether visuals, whether social, what's going to be useful for the market. I love this industry and I'm going to continue serving this industry in one way or another. That's three to five years. I like to do it at scale. I love impacting people. Um, The more people that can, you know, be, I can pour into their lives and they pour into mine, the better. And that's building a team. But yeah, they'll something in travel in three to five years. Okay. Um, probably we're probably gonna add some strategic consulting arms. Um, nice. You know, financial modeling, things that I find fun, and fill my cup. It's just harder to sell. Do you have a like a explore, play around, burn this money budget? So like at Google, employees are oh, tech yeah. told to do like twenty percent of your time on. I think that like went out the window like six years ago, didn't it? I totally remember that. Yeah. Um, I personally. Like I just posted a post, always be testing on our blog. And it's a matter of like, or the, or the marketing pulse, sorry, is what I'm supposed to call it. Sorry, Soleil, if you listen to this, <laughs> I would say on our, like right now I'm spending 15 to 20 grand a month on testing paid media strategies for Propelic. Okay. So in terms of our growth and marketing, yes, we also just opened up an office in Romania for our link building department, which was a, is a test that we're running. Um, we're also building an AI content outline tool. Um, that's another test that we're running. So we're always definitely testing things. Uh, I would say on the marketing side, if you're not testing, your marketing campaigns will die. Like if you're not unlocking new growth opportunities and not continuously allocating five to 20% of your budget for testing, then you're going to be royally screwed as soon as, you know, cost per click goes up on a specific term, for instance, that you're over dependent on. Makes sense. And is there something that's come up in the last couple marketing tests where you're like, I see something here, it's different, it's new, or nothing pops up? Been working on it for like two years with a coach, uh, his name is Garrett, but finally getting LinkedIn conversation ads to work really well Okay. and generate qualified leads for us. That's for- what you were showing the other day where you run an ad, if they click on it, it pops up a message. Exactly. I had okay. another one of those calls this morning and it nice. was uh, really solid. Nice. So like uh, move into the next stage. Why do you do $105 gift cards in 29-minute meetings? That's what Garrett told me to do. I'm okay. not a smart person. Okay. I just listen to other smart people. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, people, there's always some some new number. Like when people are doing pricing, they're like, do 97 or 197. Don't yeah. do like 99. And everyone has some theory about something. I'm just always curious yeah. how people like pick these numbers, right? Just, of, if, if you're not remarkable, nobody's going to notice. So yeah. you yeah. got to make it's it. It's also different. So you're like, oh, like I remember that 105. Okay. Exactly. That's cool. You started doing these dinners where you invite speakers out and you invite f- folks attending whatever conferences in town out. Mm-hmm. Where did that idea stem from? And where did how, that idea stem from? Has that been successful for you as a strategy? Yes to the second question. First question, I have no idea. I, I'm sure it was somebody else. I'm, I, I'm not an original idea guy. Um, on, on the marketing side, for, for consumer marketing, I am. But on on the... B2B marketing side, I typically R&D it, which is rip off and duplicate. Okay. <laughs> um, with giving credit where credit is due. Yeah. Um, but 
I don't know where I thought of it. They are incredibly like effective in terms of building a network. They don't generate clients, but they do generate referral sources 100%. and yeah. friends above yeah. all else. Like 100%. incredible friends. Yeah. It's I think I want to do something similar in like the startup space where I want to have like 10 person dinners mm -hmm. and have that be a cohort of people in a similar stage in their yeah. journey. Because you will connect better, you will probably vibe better, you'll probably have better things to relate about. Mm -hmm. Generic networking events are good, but you just say, hi, hello, here's what I do, okay, bye. Like, you don't really... Oh, God, the last time I went to one of those, oh, painful, 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 painful. One of my best, best friends, Amber, she's not as specialized with a specific market, so she does things like that. And she went to one, and she was like, the minute she got there, she left. Um, um, it's, I would say networking events, depending on where you go and how the audience has been curated there, sometimes it's all service providers mm -hmm. and that's probably not an audience or anyone wants to sell. No, through, right? I go to all the travel conferences though. You can't go to a travel conference and not be annoyed by our logo. You can't be annoyed. Oh, because you like, we're everywhere. Make it hurts. We're everywhere. Yeah. Like, I mean, but it's good for recognition, right? Yeah. So one thing I'm currently moving, like toying with is I don't think that Europe is um, the right spot for us. We've invested a lot of money in Europe for BizDev, and none of it has really come to fruition. So we're going to pull out of Europe, I think. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And your clients are worldwide? Do you focus on US Europe or? Uh, they're worldwide. Um, it's just like in certain late markets, they just aren't willing to pay for what we do. Yeah. It's been very interesting to kind of learn the dynamics of that. But yeah, no, towards the end, I like to ask a couple of rap rapid fire questions. Yeah. What's your startup tech stack and how do you run your company? And like, I'm asking more, go through top to down, like Google, Slack, whatever. Like, You want it all? Okay. Yeah. Google, Slack, free edition, because I'm cheap. Um, no matter, so you don't, you don't need messages over 10,000? No matter how much I get pestered, I will not be upgrading our Slack subscription. Okay. <laughs> that, would, that would start costing like 12K a year with the yeah. size of our team and everything. I'm like, no, but it's been great so far for free. Um, so there's that, and then there's, um, I mean, obviously the Gmail suite. We use Teamwork for project management. We use Align Today for our syncs and daily huddles. It's like scaling up software. Um, we use HubSpot. We use DealFront. We use... Uh, DealFront is a CRM? DealFront is a website visitor de-anonymization okay, tool. So like we, R R2B2. Yeah, exactly. Retention. Oh, yeah, that's the new one that that guy's building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, retention, the retention yeah, guy. Yeah, uh, that's been fun to watch. Um, there's. Uh, I think he just hit two million R. Which is outstanding. On R two B two, like attention's at twenty, I think. But yeah, that's incredible. Didn't he just start it? Like. Yeah, R B R two B two is. Um, I don't think more than a year old. Like a year at the max. If that's I mean. awesome. Good for him. Um, and then let's see. We do. Um, we're on like. We use Riverside and Transistor for our podcast, which nobody listens to, um, 25 episodes in. Um, we use um, uh, a lot of chat GPT for the team. Actually, no, we've switched ever, nearly everything to Claude. All of our workflows. 3.5? Yeah. This, is it Sonnet? No. Yeah, Sonnet. Yeah. Sonnet's the new Yeah, we've got an engineer on our team that does a lot of that stuff. His nice. name is Eric. He's a nerd, and I love him. Nice. Um, and then, uh, let's see. There's... Uh, Oh, there's so much. Give me like a what, like give me a category. No, run your company. Like, what if you want to go down on one, go down. But full company tech stack. QuickBooks. <laughs> I feel very strongly that every single person needs to know how to do bookkeeping. Yeah, 100%. that's the only way to understand your company's financial statements. You 100%. need to screw it up eight times. Make sure you take backups. I did not and had to recategorize years of books. Uh, that was fun. Um, what else do we use? Goodness, we use um, Rippling. Is okay. our HR MS? Yeah, um, that runs like everything for us now. We've got our ATS in there. We've got our, uh, which is an applicant tracking system. We've got our um, global payroll, our U.S. payroll, our benefits administration, and um, even like bill pay and receipt management in there. Nice. Um, I really like Extend. Extend is awesome if you have an Amex card. It's a virtual card issuing. It comes free with Amex business cards, and oh, you can issue okay. cards and recurring cards to your team. But it's a third party. It's not an Amex. It's a third party, but they have a, a exclusive relationship okay. with nice. Amex that's free nice. because Amex like pays them yeah. for usage. Yeah. And that's been like one of the best yeah. things that we've added. How many Amex points do you have? A lot. Like several million easily. <laughs> have you seen um, the Dave Portnoy clip? I have not. 
So you know Dave Portnoy is Barstool, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he has a black Amex uh -huh. and he goes to a Walgreens. Uh -huh. And you can pay with points at a Walgreens. Oh God. So he does pay with points. His points balance is forty four million points. That's a lot of points. And, yeah. And then there's a Reddit thread that popped off where people are calculating what he could do with that redemption. That's because like, an, uh, what? That's like four hundred thousand dollars. Four forty thousand, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's if you do one cent redemption. If you do trips, yeah, you can get much more outside. Yeah, because um, like an Emirates first class is sixty five thousand points from yeah. em, from New York to, you can get like twenty million in travel probably easily. Yeah. And so there, people on Reddit were like, well, he could travel the world three hundred times. Or like, there was a whole calculation of like, you could take around. I love uh, what? Are, let's see, favorite Reddit threads. Um, some which I can't say out loud. Um, R slash data is beautiful. Yeah, I like that one. R slash overemployed. Yes. Just before they're like pure, like what the hell? Yeah. Like what? How? <laughs> and then R slash, um, I'm drawing a blank. What are your favorite Reddits? Uh, I've been going a lot on like fire and fat fire. Okay. Um, just reading about how people manage their money, what they do. Okay. There's a little bit of like boasting as well, but there's a lot of like, hey, here's how I use the strategy to do that. And yeah. Then, um, those are two ones that. What's um, an example of a strategy? Like. Um. So like just real estate stuff of how they move money from one syndication to another syndication. They save tax. How you can um, buy commercial property, rent half of it work in half of it and then that you got a 70 80 percent write-off on most of the commercial pro so just mm. different ways people have talked about and then a lot of people ask like hey i'm getting a windfall of like 500k mm. and then how do i do this and i'll be like well what's your situation like put this much in a fi 529 do this with this mm. do or that's what i that's what like, i get from listening to dave ramsey it's like yeah. the same yeah except same, same i can like, do yeah. that while driving and he's funny yeah. i feel like i'm gonna get I, if, it, if if anybody made it to this point and it scared them away um, yeah, I've got, I've done pretty, I've gotten better at disconnecting the person from the, the ideas. It's an important skill, I think. Um, before we move on, what's one AI unlock that you've seen that's blown your mind in terms of workflow process automation, like <laughs> something you've done with AI that's like <laughs> ROI has been really high. Receipt categorization. <laughs> okay. No, I'm kidding. Um, let's see. What do I use frequently as an AI workflow? Um, personally, not me, but in terms of our efficiency, our content workflow within our company has gotten about 30 times more efficient. Nice. Um, not writing, but content research and strategy in terms of looking at statistical correlations between use of certain factors in organic search and applying those to a content outline, for instance, just like reading two megabyte Excel reports, for instance. Nice. Um, I would say somewhat on the, like, honestly, legal contract review. Okay. Um, has been really helpful because there are things that I used to not send to my lawyer because I didn't want to spend the money, but it, I get to protect myself more easily. I think that's one of the biggest uh, and easiest value adds. And then um, I would say, like, most importantly, managing a garden has been massively enriched by Glad. the audio version of ChatGPT because I can talk to it about my dying plants. Yeah. <laughs> Have, uh, has it helped you keep them alive? Oh, my God, yes. Uh, my husband wants them all dead. He says it's silly that I'm doing this, and when I go out of town, he strategically doesn't water them as much as he should. Um, if you're listening to this, Thomas, I'm watching you. No. <laughs> um, is he also in a similar space, marketing? or No, he's uh, in finance. He's uh, okay. in um, asset management for large organizations nice. and private market investments. Pretty cool. My wife and I are very against on gardening. She's like, I'll water them, but I'm not doing anything else. And you like gardening. Yeah, I, w I want to get into it. Um, yeah. So in the house we just got, I want to set up like a small backyard garden. I like try growing it. It's stuff. honestly so fulfilling. Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of, I like, I, I have leatherworking, woodworking as hobbies. Okay. Like, that's what I do for fun. It's nice. some craft. I took six months of glass blowing. Oh, that's uh, such a cool craft. Just after COVID. I can make glasses and cups from molten glass. What I will do with this skill, I have no idea. I, yeah, but, I, was, I was in Iceland last week and we went to this lava show. And they like melted lo like rock to what it must have been 1200, 1500 degrees. Yeah. And it just like 
seeing them do things with liquid rock was insane. I'm yeah. so jealous of the glass blowing. Thing. Um, there's a studio on the east side, pretty nice studio. You can take a couple easy classes for 80, 90 bucks okay. and you'll, you, they won't let you do everything. Mm -hmm. Like they won't let you take the molten glass out of the furnace, but they'll let you heat it, shape it. And they'll show you how to do those things. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's pretty fun. It's very hot. But it's really fun. Okay. Um, I, I really enjoy it. Uh, it. Sounds awesome. But it's like a sauna. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, but no, I really enjoy it. And then my wife and I did pottery. And so oh, that man. was a good. Where'd you do that? Uh, east side on airport. There's a place called Broad Studios. Okay. So there was an eight week course, three hours every week. And from scratch, they would teach you how to pull a mug, pull a bowl. Then you furnace it, um, put in the kiln. Then you, um, w what's it called? color it um Pink. i forget uh it's not it's uh, not uh you glaze it glaze, glaze it, it. Yeah, yeah glaze it and then you trim it and there's a whole it's like it's fun but Sounds awesome what am i gonna do with this guy <laughs> i have no idea um but yeah uh another thing i like asking is what are three resources that you'd recommend to someone starting out venturing into their own agency mm, find another career no i'm kidding <laughs> um it just you know to read the business of expertise by David C. Baker, um, read profit first, um, just repeating books cause they're the ones that yeah. come back. If you start hiring, read who, uh, get involved with a group, get involved with something like the EO accelerator and don't, don't get involved with like a frothy group. Get involved with people who are trying to build real stable businesses, not this startup. Like let's go raise a million dollars. You don't need to raise money to start an agency at all. Um, surround yourself with good people and, Get professional liability insurance. There you go. That's the last one. Nice. Get ENO insurance. Nice. <laughs> um, cool. I do this segment where I ask every guest for a question for my next guest. Okay. So I'm going to ask you one, but I have a question for you. Okay. How do you define potential? How do you identify potential in people you're hiring? Okay. So this person that was before me is much more thoughtful and introspective than I am. So I'll try. Um, okay. I don't hire off of potential very frequently because that scares me. Okay. I hire off of a very strong four stage hiring process driven by the top grading methodology with a very, very thorough career history interview, a skills assessment, a really strong screen, a, um, and then a, a, um, a reference that's like a self-sourced reference, not a provided reference. I have made a couple of hires without doing that. Two of them have worked out exceptionally well. One of them is still in practice. Three of them have failed miserably. The one that I am thinking is going to work out well, he's in Austin. Um, he was too junior for the role we were hiring for, but he had the energy. He had such energy. And I, I was like, we'll, we'll work with you to get you to the next level. And I think it, it's like the, cause I have people that are not like, I lean so much on the hiring process. Um, I'm trying to think like Zach, um, he, just had energy. Um, you know, you look for the hungry, humble, smart, you look for the get it, want it type things, but he didn't necessarily have the skills though. I put someone in place above him to give him the skills. And I just think that that energy will work really well. Nice. Um, the other thing is just, they know their stuff like Paul and Amanda on my team. I hired because they are, they've been directors of their service lines at other firms. Like nice. I needed, I needed that experience. Um, yeah, I don't have that great of an answer for that, but I think it, it, there's like, I, I lean really heavily on the hiring process. Cause yeah. I, I, I want to hire everybody. I love people and I'm so easy to convince that you're the right person. Yeah. So I need to like not hire on potential because otherwise I'll end up making the wrong hire. How long did it take you to come to this hiring process that you're currently I'm still at. working on it. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, t uh, it was about three and a half, four years after my first hire. Nice. And every time you see some, uh, see a gap, you'll fill it with something. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. And it's always painful. Um, miss hires are always painful. I think what people grossly underestimate the, is the cost of a hire. Um, yeah, I've got one that, when is this going to air? Um, like 10 weeks, eight weeks from now. Uh, I better not. Okay. Let's pretend there's a person that's not working out. I'm going to go through the economics of this. Okay. Um, recruiting eight to $10,000 of recruiting time. Yeah. Um, five to $12,000 of internal 
assessments time. and team time yeah. uh, in terms of at least billable time. So we're already at 22,000 there on the upper end. Um, three months of pay, 30,000 more. That's $60,000, $55,000. And then um, training time, probably 10, 15,000 of other team members' time. So we're talking like $75,000 on a three month mishire. Yeah. I know this because I'm going through this now. And this is not counting the amount of lost potential revenue because you brought them in to do X. Mm -hmm. You were gonna bill them at what? So and outside the, of their 30K salary, there's probably a lost 50, 60, 100, like inferred revenue, depending. Yeah, 75,000 in actual bared costs. Yeah. And easily, you know, we bill team members at $40,000 a month. So another 120,000 in lost revenue. So that's 200 grand in a mishire in just three months. Yeah. And no. I think people grossly underestimate. Yeah. Um, yeah it's only $3,000 a month. It's only $6,000 a month. It's only $10,000 a month. No. When I'm talking to folks who've just raised like Series A and I'm like, great, you raised, or my seed round, like you raised a million, two million. You don't have enough cash and or time to start building your team right now. Mm -hmm. You have enough cash to build a product, spend on ads, go to the next level, at which point you raise a 10 plus million dollar round. Mm-hmm then you can build a team. But I think people underestimate that you can't really build a solid tech team when you've only raised a million dollars. And like a good tech lead is like three, 400 grand. So yeah, like. but then they're like, oh no, I'm gonna go to college and hire this. I'm like, but then you're gonna have to micromanage them. Mm -hmm. And then you, but I have this argument so many times with founders, I'm like, I'm just not even gonna. I had someone who complained to me about micromanaging and my response to them was, if you don't want me to micromanage you, don't be someone who needs to be micromanaged. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. They worked for us for about two weeks after that. <laughs> I like that. What's your question for my next guest? What does balance mean to you? Okay. Do you have an answer or no? Um, I really lean into the, um, like the um, framework by Gary Keller in the book, The One Thing. Okay. Um, I was literally talking about that yesterday. Yeah, it? yeah. It's like the 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 um, metaphor he gives is a ballerina does not stand up straight, even though they look like it. They flutter very very quickly back and forth. Yeah. To create the perception that they're standing up straight, but there's a switching, 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 switching. So when I'm invested in my personal, I'm deeply invested in my personal. When I'm invested in my business, I'm deeply invested in my business, and I don't try to do both. Now all of that is words. I just did the exact opposite of that for the past month and a half. And my husband's very upset with me about it, even though he's not said anything I can tell. Um, Cause you were is, on vacation, but you were working. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And be fully present in both. So that would be my ideal state. I struggle to live up to it sometimes, but that would be my ideal state. Yeah. My wife and I fight about this a lot where like, even if we're watching a movie, like I'm phased off somewhere, like think about something or whatever. Right. And she's like, where are you? Like when we're driving, I'll just like go into a thought. Mm hmm a thought bubble and she's like snap out snap out of it like what are you thinking tell me i'm like oh, nothing because i know that because we're very different kind of, like she's she's a very strictly nine to five person yeah like after five she's like i'm done like, i'm just i just want to chill and watch netflix well my mind's always i'm like i can't just yeah. like sit idle so i think that's something i i'm trying to teach myself and be i'm about. a seven to eleven and then four to eight person Okay. Those are my sweet spots. In the middle of the day, don't like. Actually, I'm doing. No, it's past four. You have full me right now. Yeah. Um, I am useless from the hours of one p.m. to three thirty p.m. Okay. <laughs> and is that for work reasons or? Just like my huge slump of the day. Okay. Like I get up at five today. Let's see. Today I got up at five. No, I got up at five thirty. We went to the gym, went to the pool. The pool was full of swimmers. The swim team had taken it over, so just went into the weightlifting. And then got home at seven and then had breakfast and got to work at 7.30. And um, I do really good work from 7.30 to 10.30 and then really crap work from like noon to three and then really good work again from four to eight. Nice. Pretty cool. Which gym do you go to? Uh, I go to the to Shalom Austin, the Jewish Community Center. Okay, I don't know where that is. It is right down the street from where we are right now. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sweet. It's a, uh, it's like three minutes from where I live. Nice. Which is nice. Pretty cool. But yeah, that's all the questions I had for you. I appreciate the time. I Thank appreciate you. I appreciate you coming it. out. And we should do an episode two in a year and be like, 
where you at you can do everything you want to do <laughs> we'll see we'll um see. but where can we where can listeners reach out where, uh, what can we plug linkedin or email so linkedin's gonna be brennan bliss b-r-e-n-n-e-n bliss and then my email is gonna be b-r-e-n-n-e-n at propelic p-r-o-p-e-l-l-i-c dot com and we'll put a link everything as well and then Perfect. if company like if travel companies want to reach out who's the ideal icp like who who should reach out and talk to you about travel companies with great travel products that are struggling to get great travelers to come travel with them uh, or want more um, generally that's going to be a company that's uh, got someone that runs their marketing internally and um has some level of scale or is getting started with a funding fire behind them. Nice. <laughs> Pretty cool. But no, appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on and we'll link everything and plug everything for you. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. I really yeah. appreciate it. Hey.